Well, good. Welcome, everyone, uh, to today's Raiko Edipiaka talk. Um, the speaker today, uh, Raquel Martin Hernandez, is Professor of Greek at the University uh, in, in Madrid, the Universitat Complutense in Madrid. And she's a papyrologist and a philologist. Uh, she, her main research areas are, are, are the magical papyri and, and orphism. Um, and there's a very strong tradition of, of research in, on ancient magic in Spain. Uh, and she's one of, the, uh, one of its foremost exponents. Um, her, uh, her thesis, El Ofismo y Magia, of 2006, uh, is, is, is available. And, and uh, in 2010, she published a monograph on, on, uh, on Orpheus and magic, uh, as well as an edition of, of ancient, and she's also published an edition of ancient Orphic la lapidaries and texts on astrology and medicine. Uh, she's a participant in the Chicago Project for the publication of the Greek and Egyptian, the republication of the Greek and Egyptian magical papyri, together with uh, uh, Sofia Torales Tovar and, and Chris Faraone. And volume one of this series of the Greco Egyptian magical formularies appeared in 2022, just last year. And this will be the theme of her talk today. Uh, most recently, she's published an edited volume on the iconography of magic, also last year. And she's also a leader in the, in the Leiden project on structuring magic towards a digital infrastructure of texts and artifacts. Uh, today, she's going to uh, share with us her, her, her paper on composing magical formulae, formularies in late antique Egypt. Uh, so Raquel, uh, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... First of all, I would like to start, of course, uh, by thanking Professor Arpad Nash and Peter Ogox for their kind invitation to participate in this very interesting series of conferences where such uh, prestigious researchers have uh, participated and will participate in the coming days. So I hope to be up to the occasion. <laughs> So I am going to share my, my screen, my PowerPoint with you. Um, I hope you can see the first slide already and it moves. Okay. So my talk today will focus on the transmission of magical knowledge through books in Egypt during Roman times, more specifically between the first century BCE and the fifth century CE. Although the largest number of books uh, and the best quality ones are all grouped in around the third, fourth century current era. My intention in the next few minutes uh, is to make a tour in which we will draw a picture of how the books of magic look like in Roman Egypt, what were their characteristics, what kind of practices were transmitted in them, and how much can we know about magic in antiquity by studying these books as an artifact? So I will speak then not only of the text, uh, but also of the context of the materiality of the book as an archeological artifact that offers very important information for the study of the transmission of magical knowledge. To exemplify my assertions, I will make a more exhaustive analysis of one of the most important magical formularies in order to offer a didactic panorama. With my paper, I hope to bring some answers to several questions, like for example, how was magical knowledge transmitted in antiquity, how the books look like, uh, if they were transmitted in the same way as other technical books or the transmission on of other kind of science, uh, if, if uh, is there an encyclopedic intention in the composition of the books or rather are practical ones, for example. So let's see if I can just solve or at least um, uh, say something about these questions or suggest, which is uh, more interesting, to suggest uh, some others um, questions for the discussions uh, afterwards. So let's start with the transmission of magical knowledge in antiquity and a general panorama of the magical uh, handbooks. Uh, it is uh, well known uh, to all the, to all, all of us that magical knowledge uh, has tended to be grouped and transmitted in books since the most remote antiquity. 
For the, for the ancients, magical knowledge doesn't seem to be different as far as its, its transmission is concerned from that, from that of the other technical knowledge such as medicine, mathematics, astrology, or lapidaries. They, uh, they used to gather uh, different uh, procedures or different uh, parts of these uh, techniques in, in papyri, like a kind of anthologies that you can see here in this first slide. So we already have examples of the compilation of series of incantations on cuneiform tablets from the library of Asur Nasipal dated to the seventh century BCE. And we have collection of the medica medical prescriptions with a strong ritual component, for example, in Egyptian papyri dated to the uh, 15th century BCE onwards. Like this example that you can see here is the papyrus Chester VT7, which spells for protection against the scorpion stings and fever. So the circulation and use of magical handbooks in Greek and Roman culture is known to us thanks to literary testimonies, mainly from the Hellenistic and Roman times. For example, Lucian of Samo Samosatre, a Roman writer of the second century CE, dealt in his many writings with magic, witchcraft, and transmitted many stories of terror and haunted houses. To give a quite interesting example here, in his work, The Lover of Lies, the Philopseudes, um, he tells how a Pythagorean philosopher named Arignoto, ignoring the warnings of the inhabitants of a village, decided to spend the whole night in the haunted house. He does so in the certainty that, as it's, uh, you can see in the bold uh, letters, um, armed with his book of magic, in which a lot of powerful Egyptian incantations are written, he will be able to get rid of the spirit that, they, that inhabits the house as finally it happens. Also in the second century, uh, Antoni, uh, Antonius uh, Diogenes, uh, as reported by Phocius, uh, included in one of the, one of the novels he, he wrote that an Egyptian priest named Paasis cured and sometimes uh, poisons people in Tyre um, armed with a bag of books and a little bag of herbs. So the books are always there and they, they, they know that the, these magicians can carry them with them. Uh, many other literary passages will report the amount of magical books and handbooks that were stored in the houses of the inhabitants of the empire. Many of these texts are in the context of the pers uh, persecution that magic suffered in Christian times. The reference to the burning of books in Ephesus narrated in the Acts of the Apostles, the text that you have in, your, in this slide, is well known to all of us, as well as the multiple laws that condemns the possession and consultation of, magic, of magical books. For example, here in the Sententiae Pauli, um, a compendium of law uh, dated to the fifth century CE, in which all laws, um, especially that of the um, constitu this um, Lex Cornelia de Sicariis et Beneficis. So this law was reformulated after studying and applying the jurisprudence they had created. So the prosecution uh, will be extended not only to poisoners that, um, that this Lex Cornelia had, but also to magicians and even like you can see there in the, um, in the slide, uh, whoever or anyone who possesses magical handbooks. So late, le, late antique texts and above all the Christian texts will report profusely on the possession of magical books from a critical point of view. To use, for example, John Chrysostom, for example, recalls that as he was a child in the fourth century Antioquia, uh, he showed a friend who discovered a codex floating in the river containing magical recipes, for example, or uh, Zacharias Scholasticus in the life of Severus, a work uh, dated to the fifth century uh, current era, reveals that a group of law students in Beirut 
has acquired a great reputation for their magical practices, and that one of the students who was a native uh, of Egyptian thieves, which may be true or a fiction given to the fame of thieves uh, in Egypt uh, as a center of magic in antiquity. So he's, uh, he hid uh, the books of magic under his chair, for example. So according to the authors of this work, uh, this, um, this Zacharias Scholasticus, um, these books, uh, he described the books, and, and he said that these books um, um, were contained drawings of daimones, nomina barbarica, and unholy and unfulfillable promises. Uh, we will see later that this description is not far off the mark. So he, he really knew what the, these books contained. All these references are only a small sample of the many that can be found in classical and Christian texts and allow us to know what was the general knowledge that people at the time uh, had of the existence, the form, and the use of magical handbooks. Moreover, they give evidence that these books existed in all corners of the empire, even if they only uh, survived uh, for, uh, in, in Egypt. So as already mentioned, the possession of these books was persecuted and condemned by the authorities with uh, capital punishment. Then it is surprising how many magical handbooks have been preserved. Because to study the Greek magical handbooks, uh, to, to study all, all these things, we have not only these descriptions of ancient writers, but also some of the originals. The aridity of the Egyptian land has been fundamental for the preservation of the books written on papyrus, which otherwise wouldn't have survived the passage of time. So between the end of the 18th century and the beginning uh, of the 20th century, a large number of Egyptian magical handbooks dated mainly to the Roman times arrived to European museums and collections, generally from the purchase of European merchants in Egypt. The most important find for the study of magical formularies was the purchase made in Egypt by Giovanni d'Anastasi, a merchant of Armenia or Armenian origin who was consul of Norway and Sweden between 1828 and 1870, uh, sorry, 1857. Anastasi made purchases of lots of papyri, one of which contained a large number of books of magic and alchemy in both roll and codex format. Of their origin, we do not have much information since they do not come from an archaeological excavation. And in the documents of purchase and sale, the information is very, very vague. There is only reference to the fact that they came from the region of Thebes. And it is for that reason that the texts as acquired by Anastasi and that today are preserved in these museums in Europe, such as Leiden, Paris, Stockholm, etc., are those that compose uh, with greater certainty uh, the so-called Theban Magical Library. So the magical books bought by Anastasi as well as other merchants for European museums, such as the British Museum or the Louvre, um, were edited mainly by classical philologists in various publications dependent of, on the museums, as well as periodical journals at the end of the uh, 19th century. So all these uh, isolated um, editions were republished in a corpus uh, composed between uh, 1928 and 1931. I am referring to the extraordinary work that a large group of philologists led by Carl Preissendans carried out under really complicated conditions uh, and that we know today as the PGM, so the acronym of the Papyri Graecae Magicae, uh, the title of the work. In this corpus, not only all the magical handbooks known up to that time and others unpublished were edited and translated into German, but also what we call activated text, that is papyri with courses and text of protection or healing made by carefully following the instructions of the magical formularies. 
This edition was revised by Albert Henrich uh, with a um, uh, price and dance in 1974. After price and dance edition, Magical Papyri continued to appear or being edited. So the corpus was later expanded, sent to the work of Robert Daniel and Franco Maltomini, who in the Supplementum Magicum collect collected the revised, the revised edition of Magical Papyri that had appeared in um, journals or scientific publication and also edited and published material. And we should mention in this part of my talk on editions and translation of this corpus that I'm going to speak a bit in more detail later, uh, the translation of the corpus into English conducted by a group of scholars led by Hans Dieter Betz in Chicago, who in 1986 made a translation not only of the corpus of Price and Dance, uh, but uh, and some papyri that later appeared in the Supplementum Magicum, but also of the magical formularies written in demotic and the demotic parts of the bilingual manuals. This is very important fact to highlight. Presentance edition, unfortunately, contains only the part written in Greek, and in some cases, fragments and words written in ancient Coptic, which gave the strange impression of a practically monolingual corpus, when the reality, as we will see, uh, is much richer. Nowadays, an international team in which I am honored to participate, led by Christopher Faraone and Sofia Torayas Tovar at the University of Chicago, is working on a new edition of all the Greek and Egyptian magical formularies published so far, written in demotic and other Egyptian writing systems, Greek and Coptic, as well as some unpublished magical handbooks. The project, called Transmission of Magical Knowledge in Antiquity, the Papyrus Magical Handbooks in Context, has already finished the first volume, which with magical handbooks arranged in chronological order, dating from the first century BCE to the third, fourth century CE. And we are working on the edition of the next volume that will contain the Greco-Egyptian papyri dated to the between the fourth century and the sixth century CE. But let's talk about the papyri themselves, what they contain, what they are like, and how they were made. All the manuals of magic of the Greco-Roman period or of, of late antique Egypt that we have preserved in papyrus are dated between the, this scope of time, the first century BCE to the fifth, sixth century CE, and are all anonymous texts. That is, they are compilations of two or multiple ma uh, magical procedures made by a professional scribe or literate people, which transmit uh, magical procedures that way. These procedures or recipes on occasions are attributed to great magicians of antiquity or accredited authorities such as Zoroaster, Moses, Pythagoras, Democritus, or even Orpheus. Uh, but we do not have the assigned copy of a book written by a famous magician in its entirety. So they are um, like anthology, you know, they're anthologies. The texts are written mainly in Greek, the one uh, we preserve, although we have preserved handbooks written only in demotic scripts, as well as bilingual manuals in Greek and demotic, with some inclusions of recipes and letanies, as well as glosses in Coptic and in Coptic, even hieratic, etc. So therefore, although Greek is uh, the majority uh, language, the Book of Magic reflects the bilingual reality of the time. In terms of content, this manual tends to be highly miscellaneous. Although there are books in which a greater amount of a particular type of magical procedures um, were written. So choose um, a book like PGM7, the one uh, you have in the top of this slide, which I will discuss in more detail later, is a handbook in roll format, which procedures uh, of all kind uh, were copied, from divination practices to aggressive erotic magic, healing recipes, amulets, or magic tricks in the purest uh, David Copperfield styles. 
And then PGM4, uh, of whom uh, some of the pages you can see in, in this slide, is a great codex full of very complicated rituals to get a daimonic assistant for purification, uh, revelation procedures, attraction, erotic recipes, etc. So it, this, is, this is the largest of the uh, formularies that uh, have been preserved. However, and so these two are very, very miscellaneous. They have a lot of different um, procedures all collected in these, uh, in these books, in roll format or in codex format. But however, for, ex for example, we have PGM 36, which is in, in I, I, I think I didn't, no, I didn't have a, a copy of the whole thing, but uh, it's in Oslo, it's very famous and it has, it's full of drawings, so it's, it's quite famous. So this uh, Greek magical papyri number uh, 36 is a role in which practically all of its procedures are of aggressive type. Just the study of these differences between some manuals and others can give us some ideas of who were the users of these manuals. And if these books were made to order, to accumulate practices, that were particularly interesting for a given user or were encyclopedic, although they could also have some utilitarian value. So these miscellaneous books uh, gather rituals and prescriptions that cover all the possible ritual and personal utilities that one can imagine in an ancient or medieval society, but even uh, nowadays, probably. As you all can see in, in the slide, these rituals uh, try to cover or provide solutions to the needs of their users, like responses to questions about the future, to solve different problems, remedies, remedies to calm their anxieties or cure uh, their illness, to protect themselves from possible problems, or to try to achieve uh, certain privileges. There are even rituals to be more attractive or to have a better voice and convince people, etc. So by having all these recipes collected in a manual or in a handbook, sometimes all of them or, or many of them in a single manual, we can assume that all these practices were understood as similar because they were all collected in, a, in one book. So at least uh, they think that this kind of practices were susceptible to be transmitted and grouped together, just providing us with an idea of what was understood by magic in late uh, antique Egypt. So in these formularies, the recipes were written as if they were cooking recipes, where you have to follow the precise steps for the effective conclusion of the practice. These recipes can be very simple as the recipe, uh, this recipe of an erotic procedure of PGM7 that you can see here in the slide, or tremendously complicated in which the right to be performed, the necessary purifications, the letanies, the hymns to be sung, the manufactured objects that you have to do, the drawings, the gesture to be made as well as precise astrological moment in which the ritual will be performed or will be, will be more effective. Um, so all of, the, all of these things are really very carefully indicated and sequentially indicated. So these instructions can occupy even several pages of one, of one codex or several columns in a book roll. So in those recipes, these uh, procedures in which uh, the name of the, because these are recipes. So when you have to write the name of the benefit or the harm uh, of the victim of the spell or of the procedure, so a symbol is introduced, uh, which is the abbreviation of the word Deina, which is equivalent of uh, the English so and so, uh, or the Spanish fulanito and menganita. No? So a certain personal name that has to be placed when you perform the ritual. So therefore in small papyri, if this sign appears, we are certain or almost certain that it is part of a handbook or a loose recipe and not an actual magical text, which uh, we call, uh, as I said uh, previously, 
unactivated text. Another of the fundamental characteristics of the magical text and that help us most firsthand to know if a certain papyrus is a text of magic or has other content are paratextual elements such as specific images, normally demons or demons and representation of gods that have agency in the ritual. Magic words and strings of, ma of magical words are connected uh, or all, all of them connected with uh, strokes, etc., and the ubiquitous characters, uh, very, very, very popular in magical texts from the second century onwards. So this these are magical signs, the, the ones you have on your um, right, whose number and meaning is not known to us and seem to be, or seem to claim to be, a special type of communication with the gods. They also have a somewhat empowering uh, function, so uh, they embody the mystical power. So the mere presence is evidence that the object has ritual power, a certain agency. And finally, a few words have to be said about the type of divinities that appear in the text. As we have already pointed out, the environment in which these texts were produced is a multicultural in which the influences of Greek magic have entered into, into communion, commun, uh, communion sorry, with Egyptian ritual practices. Just the Egyptian divinities appear in operational equality, more or less, with the Greek divinities in the different procedures gathered in the formulary. It is true, however, that the um, that in the handbooks and recipes written in the Motic, the presence of Egyptian gods it is, is in the majority. But in the text written in Greek, all the gods appear invoked. On, on other occasions, the gods appear in the Hellenized form, as we see, uh, for example, Seth used to be invoked as Typhon Seth, for example. Uh, we cannot forget, of course, the presence of element of Mesopotamian origin or the invocation of the God of the Jews uh, in their various uh, invocation. Even Jesus Christ sometimes is invoked. So the text of the magical papyri collect a whole plethora of divinities that are considered to be operative to invoke without it seems to be important what were the beliefs of those who carried out these rituals. However, the study of the operative divinities along with the type of incantations or the type of accredited authorities uh, to which the authorship of the incantation is assigned or the way in which the incantation is promoted helps us to know more about the cultural environment of those who use this text as we are going to see when, uh, when, when uh, focused on PDM 7. So, but to give a little uh, shape to all these features uh, that I have been pointed out about the Greco-Egyptian magical formularies um, that probably are very well known uh, to all of you, the audience, I think it will be interesting to study one of these handbooks in depth uh, to see how it was produced and what text is contain it contains and to put in, in relation to other similar handbooks. Therefore, and to focus the talk on the provided title, I will focus on how magical formularies were written in late antiquity or late antique Egypt. And I will show you a very interesting handbook. And I, because I have been working uh, many years on this handbook, uh, this, this is a P. Lond uh, 121, also known as PDM 7. And when my new edition comes out, I uh, will be called, or I will call, <laughs> a Genf 74. So Genf 74, or PGN 7, is one of the largest magical handbooks preserved from late antique Egypt. Uh, the measurements are um, circa 2 meters, uh, 2 meters 33 centimeters wide and 34 centimeters high. It is an amphigraph book roll. That is, it is written on both recto and verso with, let's say, a continuous text. 
in this case, a huge amount of magical uh, prescriptions. So the content of the book is uh, the same in both recto and version. It's for that we call them amphigraphoi and not opistographoi. It has been written um, entirely in Greek, and it has been convincingly dated on paleographic grounds uh, for the new project to the 4th century CE. According to its current state of preservation, it seems to have been preserved more or less in its entirety. The book roll was purchased by um, Edward Wallace Butler, I don't know if I can pronounce the name properly, in 1888, who made several trips to Egypt and Sudan on behalf of the British Museum to buy antiquities to build a collection of cuneiform tablets, manuscripts, and papyri of the museum. According to the registers, he acquired the papyrus on behalf of, Ormers, uh, on behalf of a native uh, Egyptian. So Edward Wallace also bought some other papyri in one of his travel to Egypt. And according to the study conducted by Corsi Dosso, um, all these papyri were part of a personal or particular archive, the now so-called Hermontis Magical Archive, due the fact that one of the papyri presenting the verso accounts of a farm in this particular region, very close to Thebes. Those papyri that I will uh, refer to uh, later are PGM. So do, all the papyri that compose this Hermontis uh, Magical Library or archive is PGM 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11a. But let's return and focus on PGM 7, the longest of the papyrus belonging to this archive. So the main content of the book roll was written out by a principal scribe who copied the procedures on both sides of the papyrus just as we find in the case of other miscellaneous magical uh, manuals uh, on papyrus. According to what is usually or usual uh, in rolls, in, in book rolls, the main scribe began writing on the inner left side of the roll following the direction of the fibers and arranged his text in 90, uh, 19 columns. The last of which, as you can see here at the end, I don't know if you can see my pointer, um, doesn't reach the end of the column. Then he turned the papyrus over by flipping by the long axis and wrote 10 columns or 10 further columns. From a practical point of view, this made it impossible to read the text of the verso immediately after uh, finishing the text on the recto. So, uh, because you are, you are uh, rolling and unrolling the text, so if you reach the end and you turn that way, you, you cannot start reading because it was flipped uh, that way. So, uh, this feature sur uh, surely suggests that the text was not designed for continuous reading but rather for consultation of a specific recipes, which makes sense because it is a formulary and it contains uh, of separate, uh, it consists, sorry, of separate recipes that must be individually located uh, for possible practical use, even if it may also serve as a store of potential knowledge as a kind of encyclopedia. But we will see that the part in the, in the verso is like, um, uh, a part that is, forms a, a block, a block, an autonomous block. So the column in the in the verso, as you can see in, in the slide, were placed in the central part of the papyrus, just leaving uh, blank spaces both to the left and the right. So this choice must be due to practical reasons. The text placed in the center of the roll would be more protected. Um, once the papyrus was rolled, since the part that suffers the most are the edges. So uh, this is a normal way to write books uh, when you have to use uh, the verso side, which is not um, normal. In a second moment, uh, however, so this is the first part, and in a second moment, however, four 
uh, further columns with similar uh, content were written uh, were written on the verso by different hands. These additions will be important when we explain the relation between uh, this papyrus and the rest of the papyri belonging to the already mentioned Hermontis Magical Archive, because the, the handwriting is the same. So like other long magical formularies from uh, late antiquity, uh, PGM uh, 70, oh no, GEMF 74 or PGM uh, 7 was carefully, very carefully written. Even if it, if it uh, doesn't reach um, the standards of a literary book and compiled as a compendium on, or anthology. The compiler of the main text um, drew upon several pre-existing collections of recipes which were put together to create the present uh, manuscript. So examination of the marginal textual marks and of some distinctive uh, features of the individual procedures uh, has led um, Professor Richard Gordon and myself using different methods to formulate hypotheses concerning this process of composition and the number of previous texts used for writing this book roll. What does seem clear from my studies on the textual marks is that they uh, indicate, this textual mark indicates that the content of the book, the part written by the main scribe, uh, consists of four major blocks that you can see here in this slide. Oh, block A is for block, and it's the same. I forgot. Uh, and now I will show you how the different parts. Uh, were differentiated. So in the first block, let's see if it goes here. Well, this is the, the different blocks. So the first um, block, which goes from column one uh, to the middle of column eight, um, the scribe uses a special uh, system of lectional marks designed to mark the end of each recipe but also to divide them into groups. So this system works as follows. A forked paragraphus or this display of Elismene indicates the end of the first recipe of a group, while the other uh, recipes that belong to this group are separated between each other by a simple or a normal paragraphus. According According to Richard Gordon's study, this block contains 30 recipes that were copied from five different previous texts. But it is difficult to know whether these previous texts were already gathered in a small book that was the one uh, this scribe used to compose PGM 7. So we, we are certain that uh, this part is like a block. It was copied out following the same same structure, but we cannot know if the structure or the book, it was already done in this way and it was uh, copied by the scribe or was the scribe the one who consciously divided all the, um, all the, um, the procedures taken from different uh, smaller collections or just uh, brief re recipes. So this is the first block. And the second block uh, is the, the, this part in the, in the middle. Uh, each prescription is separated from the next by a duple of Elismene. Uh, and there is, this is the only, the only sign used in this part. Only one recipe has a simple paragraphos. And this mark separates two uh, recipes that in fact the second is a repetition of the first one. So it's it's easy to, to see that probably uh, this is a mark to say and now this is another version of, uh, of, the, um, of the recipe. Um, so this part of the volume occupies the same number of columns as, as the first block that is seven columns. This is rather remarkable and could be taken as evidence that the scribe is copying from shorter books, having the same format 
that were already composed. But it is difficult to assert it with certainty. But um, I think it's, it's very remarkable that the first block and the second block occupies exactly the same number of columns. The first block, which is uh, the, in the recto in the recto side and um, in the recto side at the end. So uh, the first block is the shortest, and it contains only nine recipes. Uh, one possibly incomplete that was erased by the principal scribe himself. The recipes in this block are separated from each other by a combination of paragraphoi and asterisks. The use of asterisks is difficult to know, but maybe it could be related to the use of um, this scribal te technique to indicate variations. So we could probably think that the scribe uses it to highlight that he's using a different source here, but it is difficult to know. Then finally, the fourth block occupies the all the, um, the text that the principal scribe wrote in the verso. This is the longest and occupies 10 columns. And it's written, as I said, in the, in the verso of this uh, papyrus roll. Each procedure is separated from the next by a forked paragraph, this um, diple of Elismene that, that you can see here. And the normal paragraphos is used to divide the constituent part of more sophisticated um, procedures. So this part of the of the um, formulary has longer uh, procedures, more complicated, more ritually more complicated that has to be divided uh, just to make sure that you are following clearly the steps that you have to follow to perform the ritual correctly. So then you can see that the book was really well planned to get a fixed structure that can be followed by noticing the different magical, uh, magical, no, marginal, marginal marks described used to separate the spells and to indicate parts of them uh, or the sub subdivisions, right? So regarding the content of the book, as is the case with other large magical formularies, is quite a uh, despair. These um, procedures to achieve a prophetic answer appear along with recipes for protective, therapeutic, aggressive, and erotic aims. The order in which the different procedures are ordered is also dis disparate, um, different, strange, um, seems nonsense. However, a kind of evolution can be observed. The procedures tend to become longer and more ritually complex as the volume continues. So uh, at the very beginning, we have procedures that occupy one or two lines. And in the, the four block, the part on the verso, we have procedures that occupy two columns. It is as if we had a book uh, ra ranging from recipes for inexperienced or uh, learning magicians to advanced level recipes. So it's like a, a book order from very, very easy uh, or ready-made um, procedures to very complex ones. That said, the general character of the recipes gathered in the volume is, uh, I, and I think is markedly client-oriented, with few complex recipes and without prescriptions for initiatory um, practices to be developed by the practitioner. So they are quite simple. In this sense, um, PGM-7 differs uh, strengthenly from other complex and miscellaneous formularies, such as the Greek Magical Codex, for example, which contains very complicated rituals like the Mithras Liturgy or the Dardano Sword. Or, so this, this, is, uh, this book is quite practical. So the simple, practical, and client-oriented nature of the book can be also noticed uh, by the fact that it is the only magical formulary preserving a lot divination text, which is the Omero Manteion, located just at the beginning of the book. This is the first procedure we have in the book 
for this reason is uh, the the state of, of preservation is quite terrible and this divinatory text has been preserved in two other papyri of miscellaneous mature normally ambitious collection of magic uh, prefer more complex divination rituals especially those involving involving uh, an effective uh, contact with the divinity, these uh, autoscopias or, or like um, that you see the divinity. But in, in this papyrus in PGM7 has in fact recipes to get an oracular response uh, from, a from a daimon or a god by direct contact, but they are much simpler than other procedures we preserved in other formularies. Then the compiler, or the scribe of this formulary seems to have two different purposes by compiling this book. On the one hand, to provide amusing, uh, useful, interesting topics for discussion in, in dining groups, for example. All, all of them are located at the beginning of the book with texts like the Omeromanteion that can be performed in the, in the symposium and is it, it, it was um, circulated in, in other uh, papyri. So we know it was performed in, in, by people um, with comrades uh, at the symposium and the Democritus tricks, for example, that, that are to be used in the context of the symposium as Professor Attilio Mastro Cinque, for example, have studied well. And you can see here in the slide, no, this uh, to make eggs become uh, like an apple or uh, to, to not stink after eating garlic or this says to be ingested. And they are talking about uh, that they are in the symposium. So you, you can do these things um, or speak uh, about these things um, in, this, in this context. No? On the other hand, it seems that the book is oriented to be useful to fulfill a fairly narrow range of pragmatic desire, like obtaining advice about decisions to be made, um, alliance reads from superiors, opponents or enemies, and obtaining sexual intercourse. So having in mind that the book uh, gathers recipes to be performed with comrades in the symposium, and not very sophisticated and ritualized to get favor and cover very pragmatic desires, let's talk or just have some thoughts about the possible clients of this book, who, who, who could use it. No? When I say the book is oriented to a well-defined clientele, I mean to men, uh, at least the, um, the potential clients of this text, probably men highly Hellenicized. So the book, as it has been already said, is written only in Greek. And although the procedures do contain, of course, the usual blend of Egyptian and Greek elements with comparative few Judaic elements, such as the popular invocations uh, to Iao or Adonai, it seems deliberately oriented towards a relatively educated Hellenic, Hellenic uh, clientele. The citations of accredited authorities in this book never includes Egyptian priests, for example, which are very which are usual in other contexts, or even Eastern magicians like Ostanes or Zoroaster. They they are they don't appear in this um, in this handbook. Rather, they are the these accredited authorities. They are Homer, Democritus, Pythagoras, and even we have an Orphic logos here in this papyrus. Moses is cited only once, but his relation with the Jewish patriarch um, in this text is purely anecdotal, uh, as this has been well studied. So only once uh, is a praxis, only once, claimed to, der to derive from a book in an Egyptian temple, which is, uh, is very normal in, in, in magical handbooks, um, especially those written in demotic. And even in this case, the latter uh, is said, so this Egyptian temple is said to be that of Aphrodite Urania at Aphroditopolis, instead of saying the temple of Hathor or Hathor in Thieves. So they are, it, it is translated, let's call it that, that way, no? translated into the Hellenistic or Hellenic version 
of the goddess and the city. So although on course Egyptian, uh, Egyptian gods such as Osiris, Isis, Anubis, etc., uh, et are involved, this tends to occur only in a restricted number of recipes. What abounds is in these proceedings are the invocation of gods, divinities, and abstractions or in their Greek designation. So we have um, invocation to Hephaestus, Apollo, Athena, Hermes, Aphrodite, Tiche, Estia, Nemesis, Moira, Imene, etc., etc. So uh, it's in this sense that I say uh, that the clients are. Um, so the, the text is like client oriented to this uh, population. Finally, some uh, words uh, must be said regarding um, the other papyri that along with PGM7 and belong to the so-called Hermontis archive. As I said at the beginning of my talk, and according to the study of Corsi Doso in uh, BASP, PGM7 was acquired with, um, with the following text, with PGM8, 9, 10, and 11a. All the magical papyri from the archive are formularies. They are not activated texts. Um, and they differ greatly, um, however, in, the, in its format. So for example, the uh, two of them, which is a PGM 9 and PGM, PGM 11A are, um, are very brief um, in containing only just one recipe. Uh, however, other two formularies, which are a PGM 8 and PGM 10, are uh, what we call small collections of procedures. So with some recipes, but not many. So the only Great book is PGM7. So this is the only one. So the contents of the archive just reflect the variety, the variety of formats in which magical knowledge could be transmitted in written form, which is in the form of, of a sheet, just with one uh, procedure or small uh, or brief uh, formularies. That is this one you have you have here. PGM 8 and, and PGM 10, or large book rolls like PGM 7. If we look at all the papyri of the Hermontis library, which are these, um, we should first emphasize the strictly monolingual character of these texts, all of which are written only in Greek, with hardly a trace of, Egypt, of Egyptian language. Second, there are faint similarities between the legitimation strategies found in these four texts, normally again uh, addressed not to Egyptian press, press, uh, priests, sorry, but to other authorities like, uh, for example, the, the old woman uh, of Apollonius of, of Tiana, etc. So besides some similarities in the use of list for, oops, oh, uh, for example, here, the use of lists, which are very pro pro normal in PDM 7, the use of stellae that are uh, very popular also in PDM 7, etc. So all these, um, uh, all these um, features um, are, are uh, they put all, all, the, all these um, books um, together. So, um, Stella, uh, similar spells like the divination procedure addressed to best, for example, this procedure here that starts here and all this here is uh, it, it has a variation uh, in PDM7, for example. So um, they are good sample of the tastes or needs of a practitioner or a select group of users for which these books were collected. Uh, this uh, study of the content of all these texts and their materiality led me to think that they uh, also were intended to be potentially used or served uh, to the interest of these um, kind of Hellenized um, clients, for example. And uh, we have to say uh, also 
that, for example, this uh, the, the hand the handwriting of PGM uh, seven appears in PGM seven in one of the addenda that were um, written afterwards, and th this hand is also also appears in another procedure written in PGM seven. So the people writing these books were the ones who copied out uh, some um, procedures from other uh, sources to the blank pages that were left in PGM 7. So they belong probably to one person or uh, two or three uh, persons. So to sum up, um, greco egyptian magical formularies uh, are fascinating texts from which we can study not only the type of lived religion and magical practices of the inhabitants of Roman Egypt, but also studies on how this knowledge was disseminated and could be specialized for specific users or population groups depending on an important number of factors. Combining the study of all the data I mentioned in my talk, exemplified in the case study of PGM7, a lot of questions arise. What can be known about the actual usefulness of these formularies in antiquity? Were they really used or were they just books uh, that accumulated encyclopedic knowledge just to read and have fun? Um, was the book the privileged property of a practitioner? Does it make sense to claim that different books were significant only for a certain sector of the population? All these questions are very, very difficult to answer, and only a combination of the study of literary texts, speaking about the use of magical books, the actual text of the magical formularies, along with a material study, and the relation between one text to others, and the Greek parts with the demotic parts, and all the, uh, even the Coptic um, papyri uh, afterward. Um, Localizing ancient archives or libraries can provide more authoritative answers uh, than those based only in the study of the text. So I hope you enjoy the, the talk and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that, Raquel. Uh, that was that was that was really re really enjoyable, and I learned so much um, <laughs> about this about this this body of this body of texts and and actually of uh, and actually of, of, of books and uh, which about which I uh, which which I which which I personally knew practically nothing. Um, it's a it, it's a very uh, it's very interesting material, not just from the point of view of of uh well of magic and religion and and greco egyptian coexistence and uh but also uh, also i think of uh, for the for the for the history of the book as well um i i want to uh open the floor for questions uh and 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 comments and as usual uh if uh, if people i obviously it's it's best if uh it works best if people um, if people are, are are willing to willing to uh, to turn their cameras and microphones on and actually actually sp uh, speak to the to to, to uh, interact with our speaker, but if you uh, if you if you if you prefer, you can put uh, comments in the in the chat and and I'll read them out for you um, as well. So uh, yes, does anyone have a have a, have have any kind of response or question to uh, to Raquel's paper? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Hello. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> we have just translated uh, the Latin uh, uh, translation, the Picatrix, which was a translation of Gayat al-Hakim. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to listen to your lecture because I've just learned that uh, probably most of our text in Picatrix comes for, come from uh, Greek papyri. Mm. So my question would be, is there any astrological aspects in these recipes or mm. not? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your 
and 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 congratulations because uh, this uh, study on Picatrix is it's it's a fantastic book. So I'm looking much looking forward to read your your work. So the um, well, astronomy is is used in the corpus of the Greek magical papyri, but it's not very sophisticated. I may say um, most of the um, most of the instructions that uh, telling that, for example, you have to perform a ritual um, in that um, astrological moment usually are connected only with um, where is the moon regarding the ecliptic. So if the moon is in Aries or if the moon is in Leo, etc., or the faces of the moon. So normally, it, I think there is only one uh, recipe uh, that you have to take into account this, where is the sun, but most of them is uh, where is the moon and where is the moon in the ecliptic. So we have the synodic uh, year uh, or the month and and that's it. It's, they they are very, very simple. Um, nothing so sophisticated as you can see, for example, in, in books or, um, or codex that transmitted um, astrological uh, knowledge, which are very, very complicated. So it's in Greco, Greco Roman magic or astrology, etc. is that they have uh, parallel uh, ways of transmission. So they can interact each other sometimes, especially to do the uh, horoscope, but no, they, they don't interact too much. So as far as I, I can say. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, thank you so much. In Picatrix also, the, the moon is always the, the most important uh, uh, of the planets because that's what, what is trans, transfers all the, all the effects of the other um, planets as well. So yeah. here in, in, the, in PGM 7 as well in PGM 3, we preserve a calendar which is uh, depending on, it's called the cycle of the moon. So it's the moon in Virgo or the moon in Tan and uh, specify uh, what kind of uh, magical procedure you get with better result depending on. So for, feel, for erotic practices, when the moon is in Virgo, for whatever, when the moon is in Tan. So, so this is the only, for example, is the only calendrial uh, astrological calen calendar that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Really enjoyed your lecture. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I, I think. Uh, uh, sorry, we, so we we have a we have a, a question here from from Arpad actually. Uh, he asks, uh, "What is the youngest magical handbook in the PGM corpus, and how can we date it?" By youngest, Arpad, you mean earliest or latest? Sorry, then. Oh, the which is it the? Sorry, I meant the uh, the latest. The latest. Ah, the latest okay. uh, manual written in Greek. I think it's dated to the fifth century CE, at least in papyri. So the formulary that we have, mm -hmm. fifth, six, beginning of the sixth. Then they started writing in Coptic. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> At least, uh, yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, most of them. Yeah, fifth, six, CE. And we we have a question from Marianne uh, Michilio. Uh, uh, she asks, are there <laughs> are there any references to Solomon's Temple or to the inner workings of the Giza pyramids and the its use in magic? Uh, the its use as magic. Uh, no, no. Uh, in this, the formularies, no, we don't have, we mm -hmm. have some King Solomon seal, but it's much later. It is, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't have them in, I think there is only one reference to King Solomon, but uh, nothing that sophisticated that is going to be a great mm -hmm. A, a thing no? uh, in medieval or Byzantine, Byzantine magic, but not uh, at this state of the transmission of magical knowledge. 
here is Moses, the most, uh, um, from the Hebrew uh, part um, is, is Moses, the one who, in, in fact, PGM 13 has uh, three versions of the, of one magical book by Moses. So, and Moses used to appear a lot, but not, not Solomon. Well, uh, yes, Athanasia Sograffo. Hello, thank you, Raquel, for this uh, beautiful talk. Hi, Athanasia. Uh, al always useful and uh, beautifully pre presented. Uh, just a question. Um, uh, I think that this distinction between uh, manuals and applied uh, applied magic is uh, crucial, of course. Uh, but um, do you find um, features in papyri which uh, show that uh, some of them uh, could be regarded as uh, efficient by themselves and not uh, only by the content? Uh, I mean, uh, in the layout or other features, uh, you mentioned the f uh, seven columns. Uh, so we can think, or uh, efficient in, in some extent, of course. Mm -hmm or um, active in some mm -hmm. extent? Yeah, yeah, this is a really good question. Thank you, Athanasia, because yeah, what we have, for example, when they are copying out a procedure from another recipe or another book, uh, really they are taking good care of what they are doing. And they used to even um, draw uh, how the words have to be written in order to be effective. Because if, if you write the word in different order, um, the, the spell doesn't work. So for example, uh, we see that in uh, when, when the instructions are telling, um, you have to write this word in the form of a wing or in the form of a bunch of grapes. And the scribe starts writing the, the word and they start writing, you know, uh, removing one letter from the beginning and the end just to form a, a triangle, which is very popular for aggressive purposes and fever healing. And then he said, well, probably I'm wasting too much papyrus. And he does like this. <laughs> So you have to do it for yourself. I'm going just to tell you how to do that, but I am not going to waste all these papyrus. I have to, to start with. So they are aware uh, of letting the user know how to do or to perform that uh, in a very specific way. And it happens the same when they describe images. Uh, sometimes you have to write or draw uh, a god, and sometimes this god is already written or drawing in the papyrus for you to do um, to do the, um, the drawing exactly the way it must be. So they, they, they produce them as an activated text, but to be copied out um, because sometimes they do don't do, they don't do that. They just uh, write the description or uh, Left, left the the triangle, you know, in at the at medium. No, they say, okay, that's it. You have to do it that way, and when you perform the ritual, do it uh, do it that way. So yes, yes, yes. But this is very yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you. I I also think of uh, the ways they hide these books. Uh, yeah. For instance, they if they if they consider them dangerous, uh, uh, not only not only uh, to be condemned of uh, yeah for yeah. for re for uh, these reasons, but uh, uh, yeah. I don't know dangerous. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know because we don't have mm. too many descriptions of how they were gathered mm. or if they were put in a special room or something like that. So they were collected in the temples. I mean, uh, the, the Theban library probably was part of a, 
temple, an Egyptian temple, because they do not have this distinction between magic and religion or rituals that we have, or that uh, was, you know, at, in Roman times when this kind of practice were condemned. So mm -hmm. we do not have descriptions, and we know that people like the like uh, Lucian that this he said, well, this guy goes with the books of magic or, or the other in Beirut that uh, you know go with the book of magic and and the colleagues are taking a look on, on it. So I don't know if there was a practice of to hide them because of their power, not related to to the prosecution. Um, we have these instructions for secrecy, which is not exactly the same thing, but yeah. could, um, exactly uh, be associated. Yeah, but we have Thank the you. same. Yeah, but we have the same. This is so fantastic. That the, we have the same. For example, when they are uh, or the transmission of um, medicine or the transmission mm -hmm. of lapidaries that they say, do not tell that to blah blah blah. <laughs> for, no, because it's. You know, uh, uh, probably it's a topos literario, no? There's a literary topos to say that uh, this is hidden, you don't have to reveal, just to keep in secret, etc. I don't know, because we can, I mean, in the Orphic Lapidarius, uh, it starts that way, that I, I'm telling you that, but you don't have to tell it's, anybody, blah, blah, blah. It's part of the marketing. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. It was thank really you, wonderful. Athanasia. Uh, thank you, Athanasia. Uh, I think Max Latham has been waiting for a while to ask a question. Mm -hmm. um... uh, yeah, if you could... Uh, I, we can't hear you, Max. Uh, because there is... I, I'm seeing one, one question in the... Um, uh, yeah, chat. okay in the chat uh wait maybe maybe we'll deal with that one first then and then max if you've got your uh your microphone uh together we, uh, we'll come back to you yeah so uh uh Pantazi sarafis asks uh about the about the uh the, the mixture of elements of many religions in mm -hmm. in diary, so greek egyptian judaic um yeah. And could, could we imagine a monotheistic Jew or a, a monotheist Jew or a Christian to use these formularies? Or have we to suppose that they were only for pagan readers and clients, Greeks, Egyptians, Syrians? Yeah. Who knows? I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have many evidence of that. We have um, a lot of um, text, activated text, um, that, are, that are following the same structure as, as pagan, um, let's let's call pagan uh, text, uh, but used by Christians, and and we know it. They they change just the uh, the name Sabaoth, and they put Jesus Christ, and that's it. So the technology is the same. So they they use them with, uh, but, but this we can see this clearly after the fifth or the sixth century when the Christian people or the is is well established but at the very beginning when the christians are just groups that they do not uh, they are not uh, centralized uh, it is difficult to say and we have for example uh is as far as i know is uh, augustine san, san Agus, uh, augustine uh, in confessions uh, he says that um um that we have he says that people shouldn't uh, use the pagans uh, amulets so they have to uh, believe in the power of the cross etc so there is people that actually uh, go to the mass or the sermons of the fathers and they are wearing uh, pagan amulets and he's telling no don't do that you have to wear the inky pits of the gospels because he said that <laughs> so so just it's to make a translation, but you know, in order to follow with the same um, the same technologies, but um, you know, translated. But at the very beginning, probably they use them, but we don't have the evidence. You you only have the paper with the ghost, and you know, you don't know who is wearing that because, and it is very difficult. It's a very difficult question that I I really I cannot understand. I, I cannot answer. But thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, Max. Sorry, it's still not working. Oh, oh I cannot hear you. No, we can't hear you. Uh, maybe you can type it in the chat for me and I'll read it out. In the meantime, do we have another question? Do we do we have any traces of uh, I, I you may have you may have talked about this I, uh, and if so I, I was inattentive but uh, do, are there any traces of a textual tradition in the of, of a textual tradition so I, I mean are there are there are there are there uh, pieces in one papyrus that have obviously been been copied from a similar source as another or something like that yeah. Uh, yeah. We have um, um, we we have procedures uh, written that are a um, variation mm -hmm. uh, that is written in another um, manuscripts, but probably there were too many um, spells or procedures that were copied out in just single sheets that were changed, and, and there is a we we only have these very great books. Uh, mm -hmm. But probably it was plenty of of exchanges and variation. And for example, it is very usual in formularies that you have a, you have a, a procedure, a, a spell, and then it say allo, which is another yeah. version of this one. Yeah. And it say and then allo, another version. So the scribe is gathering the, from it's, different. It's just like uh, in the ancient school, yeah, to Homer, for example. Uh, yeah. 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 You they are, say, you know, yeah. trying to to have all the all, all the potentials uh, yeah. uh, that um, are there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Professor Clark. Uh, hello, I just wanted to uh, add a little bit concerning the answer to your last question about the tradition. I would say perhaps the most interesting and in any case, the most far reaching tradition can be demonstrated within the Egyptian language material uh, because um, I know an unpublished heretic papyrus, heretic but in early demotic language dating mm -hmm. to about the sixth century BCE oh. with invocations to Imhotep and in it, there is one historiola, which is almost identical um, to a demotic one in Leiden E384 verso, which is, I think, PGM 12. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, no, the tradition is, they were copying and copying and copying because they need, they thought it was effective. So you, you have to start writing and writing and writing again. And they are very conservative. And, and yeah, for sure, all the magical, uh, the handbooks, especially those written in, in the Motic, uh, the bilingual or the, the Motic, are, they are enrooted in the Egyptian temple uh, literature, of course. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But thank you. I didn't know this, uh, this papyrus dated so, so early. <laughs> and it's unpublished or, or it was? Uh, it's unpublished, uh, but I gave some preliminary remarks on it and also on this direct parallel in an article about Mhotep I published about nine years ago. So okay. uh, just, just write me a mail and then I can send you a PDF of that oh, article. Oh, thank you so much. I will be, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I will write you for, for the article. I will. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, it was amazing. Uh... Oh, we have a we have a uh, okay. So Max has written his question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, okay. the, the symbols so which are written. About the characters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the symbols appear in Pitacatris and the Renaissance, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, this is one of the um, <laughs> things that uh, we were talking about in this um, structuring magic, this uh, workshop we had. Um, just to to see that there are symbols and um, very specific um, motifs and and um, symbols and uh, signs and seals that are uh, you can trace from the fifth century BCE to the 
Renaissance and even now with the new Wicca things and, and new age uh, beliefs, etc., that they are uh, remerging. And it is very, very interesting that um, they, they are, we don't know the meaning of them. We don't know anything. We only know that probably they were thought of a kind of a special language uh, to speak with the gods. Uh, but but they they evolve a little bit and um, for example in Copt in Coptic text um, we have characters but also we have ringed letters so it's letters written in Coptic but with the form of characters with these uh, balls or round things in, in in them so you know a combination of or to empower the text a little bit more just. Uh, doing this text as characters, but you can you can see that they are not only in in in, in Greek and of, of course in, in demotic, etc., but they are in Arabic, they are in Hebrew, they are in Ethiopic uh, magic, they are in Syriac magic, and they are everywhere. So yeah, this is so we don't know who um, what they are, so there are some attempts to, um, there is Professor Richard Gordon has written an article very, very, um, I think it's very useful um, on on characters. Uh, Atilio Mastro Cinque has written on it. Uh, there is a doctoral dissertation by by Kristen Svitsa. I, I cannot, I don't know if I pronounce well her surname, but she, she wrote a dissertation and she has a um, database with uh, a, a kind of type, type, typification, is that a typo, typology uh, yeah. for characters or for the studies of characters, but yeah, it's very complicated. So we need people studying that if you are interested. <laughs> well, do we, do we have any other, any other questions or comments? For our speaker, Mona. Just, just some remarks on uh, still on Picatrix and uh, the users of uh, of these magical texts and uh, uh, all the copies that uh, uh, Picat uh, Picatrix, uh, which is is tra already translated in into English by mm -hmm. uh, David Porek and Danatra in 2019, we uh, produced a Hungarian translation. So unfortunately, you well, won't. You won't read it, I don't think so. Uh, with the uh, 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 and I'm Monica Fezerin Rega. I'm also on my laptop, but my microphone is not good, so uh, that's why I'm talking to my iPhone. So, Picatrix compile compiler talks about his work that he he put together his textbook, which is a kind of an encyclopedia of magic, mm -hmm. in six years and copied uh, 226 books which is which is for me it's understandable now you you showed me all these papyri because probably they were papyri so mm -hmm. his books are these ones you are showing us i think and i think for you it would be extremely exciting to, to read all these recipes in Picatrix because you will recognize the text yeah. you are yeah, reading. Yeah, yeah. Think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah, they, they call book even to a sheet it's of papyrus uh, with two, book, with two recipes. They, this is a book for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And the users, uh, Picatrix's uh, compiler highlights always that uh, this is not religion, nothing to do with religion. This is pure science. So, <laughs> because because he was uh, an uh, Arabic person, and uh, uh, I mean uh, Gayata Hakim's uh, the, the uh, true compiler who who put it together in the sixth tenth uh, century, and uh, Latin or Castilian uh, uh, translators were also you know very careful about uh, not to be in danger so they always always uh, highlight that this is this is science yeah hmm. and we know that uh, the, the book for for very very long the uh, latin translation wasn't shown up uh, the first uh, uh, 
half of the book uh, in, in an entire form. Uh, first uh, appeared in the 15th century in Cracovia, in Krakow. Mm -hmm. So in 1456. Uh, 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 and before that, we have only tiny bits of it. So uh, it's very interesting that this very middle age uh, text is really a Renaissance one because that's where, where it, it really, you can find it everywhere, you know, in, in full copies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other uh, any other questions? Well, if we've dried up, then perhaps we will uh, we'll end today's meeting. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Raquel, for the for the uh, for the wonderful stimulating paper and for the for the very exciting discussion. Uh, I've learned a lot, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, yeah, so we're 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 very grateful that you could come and come and get this paper. Um, and I uh, so the the series will continue next month. Uh, at the end of April, uh, we'll be sending the uh, sending. Uh, sorry, on, on uh, just let me see. Uh, April the twenty fifth, uh, and our speaker will be Carolina Lopez Ruiz uh, from the University of Chicago, talking about Egyptian Heracles, Syrian Aphrodite, disentangling perceptions of Phoenician art and religion in the Greek tradition. Uh, so I, I I hope to hope to hope to hope to see you all there on the twenty fifth of April. But thank you very much for coming and have a good evening. Thanks to you, Peter. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. <laughs>